Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leon Hartwell. Today is a very special day as it marks our 30th LSE Ideas Russia Ukraine Dialogue, a series that we launched in the aftermath of the February 2022 escalation of the war. We continue to strive to cover the Russia Ukraine war from a variety of angles by bringing together military experts, government officials, think tankers, and academics from a host of nations. I would especially like to thank our audience as well as our partners for your consistent support. We are part funded by PeaceRep, an international research project led by the University of Edinburgh Law School, which delivers research and tracks data on conflict and its resolution. Today's panel will focus on sanction regimes against Russia in response to the February 22 escalation of the war, a topic that continues to be strategically imperative both to Ukraine and Russia. Now, on Sunday, President Zelensky stated that it is very important that Russia receives ever stronger signals that the world will not forgive any of Russia's acts of terror, and that as many global players as possible are absolutely principled in upholding the sanctions regime against Russia. Since the get-go, sanctions have aimed to weaken Russia's ability to finance the war and specifically target political, military, and economic elite responsible for the full-scale invasion. Today's panelists will discuss the impact of current sanctions on Russia, their effectiveness on deterring Russia's aggression, and potential new measures that could be taken to increase pressure on the Russian government. To discuss these issues, I'd like to welcome three very distinguished guests. First, I'd like to welcome Hannah Stepta, Council heading the International Commercial and Trade Practice in the Kiev office of Baker McKenzie. Welcome, Hannah. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Viljar Lubi, uh, who is Estonia's ambassador to the United Kingdom. Welcome, Ambassador. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Professor Timothy Malovanov, President of Kiev School of Economics, and former Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture of Ukraine. Welcome back, Timothy. Um, first, we're going to start off uh, with Hannah today. Hannah, um, if you would unmute for me, please. Since the February twenty, since February twenty twenty two, uh, how has the war impacted economic relations between Ukraine and Russia? Thank you, Hannah. Uh, thank you, Leon. So, starting immediately after the war, there have been introduced uh, like extensive measures, actually like restricting and, and fully prohibiting all economic relations between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and it not only like banned all payments to Russia or for Russian beneficiaries, even indirectly, um, uh, trade of Ukrainian goods. Uh, with this nation to Russia or ban on import of Russian goods. Uh, it's um, also prohibited all performance of obligations in favor of Russian companies. So there was a huge uh, uh, package of restrictions, which are not sa sanctions under Ukrainian sanctions law, but actually banning trade and economic relations between the countries. But further, uh, Russia was recognized as a terrorist state in Ukraine. So it's recognizes a aggressor state and it's recognized as a terrorist state and this resulted in criminalizing any providing of any uh, goods services or financing uh, either directly to Russia to the companies registered in Russia or where Russia is a beneficiary this was a major development because uh, it not only restricted these operations for Ukrainians but also for any other it encompasses any other companies or individuals worldwide so from ukrainian law perspective even if it's a us or a EU registered company or individual if they provide for example goods or services to russian military or critical infrastructure or pay significant tax in russia or provide financing they are they they may be considered as financing the russian aggression against ukraine and, and actually financing terrorism under Ukrainian laws. So, so there was, um, so if we look at, at the relations of economic relations between Russia and Ukraine, so they of course have been impacted critically and, and a lot of uh, restrictions were introduced in Ukraine to completely 
uh, ban such uh, possibilities. And we know that, the, that Ukraine tries to enforce them as well. Thank you, Hannah. I, I think that's good uh, food for thought to trick us off on this discussion, because I think one of the things that we don't always think about in the Western world is how this impacts on, on, on Ukraine and what type of measures Ukraine specifically has taken in relation to, to Russia. And of, of course, like as you laid out, the implications are quite, um, uh, uh, have massive legal implications, the fact that Ukraine identifies Russia as a terrorist state. Um, let's move the discussion now to uh, Ambassador Luby. Uh, Villar, if you could please unmute for me. Um, what are the highlights of the EU sanctions regime against Russia? And what are the major effects of those sanctions? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think, you know, the highlights, I think the highlights are the areas where uh, we can have been able to reduce the revenues from the Russian side the most. And obviously it is mostly about uh, regarding oil and gas. And we already see that the sanctions are working well so that uh, the revenues Russia is receiving from uh, selling oil and gas has, has uh, let's say, compared to last year, already reduced by 46%. So it really shows that it is, it is working, uh, the, the sanctions are working, and, and Russia is lo uh, losing the, uh, let's say, extremely important cash it needs to finance uh, its war uh, operation against Ukraine, but also to keep its economy running. As we all know, the Russian economy is so much dependent on oil and gas and also the uh, budget is dependent on oil and gas revenues. So uh, the first two months of this year, all the, uh, the Russian uh, budget has been deficit. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the... um, Ambassador. Uh, I think your sound is not coming through very well. Hannah and Timothy, can you just nod in agreement if that's the case, if you're also struggling? Yeah. I don't know if you could perhaps um, add um, uh, some earphones if, if possible by any chance. Um, and while yeah, you do, that, uh, while you do that, I'll I'll go to Timothy uh, in the meantime. Um, uh, Timothy, how are U.S. sanctions well, different? Uh, let's see. Let's try your. Let's hear yeah, you again, let's, Ambassador. Let's try again. Is, is this better? Oh, that's much better. Yes, please continue. Okay. So what? Uh, okay. Just to to uh, sum up what I said before. I think uh, if you didn't hear me, I'm so sorry for that. Uh, especially coming from Estonia, that you know every Estonian should be IT expert. So, but at least uh, now you uh, now you uh, I, uh, identify that I have an issue. I managed to solve it. Thank God for that. So, I think that you know sanctions are working well because the biggest uh, uh, impact of sanctions is that we have been able to reduce the uh, revenue Russia is collecting from selling uh, its oil and gas to the world, uh, and the re reduction has been already year on year 46 percent. And why it's so important? Because the Russian budget that is used to uh, finance its aggression against Ukraine uh, is so much dependent on, uh, on oil and gas as well. And the first two months of this year, we have seen that the budget deficit has been only 35 million uh, dollars, uh, and it, had, it is 90% of the uh, deficit that the Russian government set planned for this year. So that they only have reached 90% of the budget deficit that they plan for the whole year. So I just wonder how we, they, they do it uh, the rest of the year. Of course, we know that we have some reserves, and we still know that uh, Russia still gets a lot of revenues from selling oil and gas to the third, the third countries, not the EU, but not the US and others. So that I want to only say that sanctions are working. We have to work on that. How do we reduce it even further? I'm sorry, Ambassador. Your your son is, uh, is, is again quite quite uh, static at, at present. I'll, I'll, I'll move to Timothy in the meantime, and then we'll circle back um, to you in the next round um, while you get that sorted out. Uh, Timothy, um, let, I'd like to ask you, how are US sanctions different from EU sanctions? Uh, who's tougher on the, on the Kremlin? Uh, you're muted. The sanctions of the United States in practice are tougher. They have sanctioned more people, more companies, and they are implementing them much faster. Fin financial sanctions are stronger, and sanctions uh, on individuals are tougher in general, both in terms of physical constraints and financial constraints. 
But the EU embargo on oil is super tough for Russia because, of course, uh, this is a major market for Russia. And this is much costlier for the EU as for some other members of the coalition. Um, at the same time, when it comes to the intention of uh, de designating Russia to be the state sponsor of terrorism, and let me digress for a second. Even if you don't want to accept the argument that Russia itself is the terrorist state, it clearly sponsors Wagner in Ukraine and throughout the world. And therefore it should be designated as the state sponsor of terrorism, according to the standards that have been applied to other countries, including in particular Cuba. So Cuba is sanctioned, Russia is not. So digression back, you know, going back on, on point, uh, really the EU moved ahead and has designated the uh, Russia to be the state sponsor of terrorism. However, it doesn't have any framework for this designation to be substantive and meaningful. Uh, the EU, however, uh, argues that it is willing to develop such a framework to make it comparable to that of the US. By contrast, the US has the framework, but has not designated the uh, Russian agencies or Russia itself as terrorist or state sponsors of terrorists. So what we are seeing is that the frameworks of the US are better. They are willing to implement them tougher and faster where it doesn't hurt politically or where it's feasible politically. Why the EU takes time, but is willing to pay a cost. Thank you, um, Timothy. That, that's also a, a great summary of, of the current situation and, and some of what you've mentioned kind of resonates also with, with what uh, Villar has mentioned earlier. Um, let's, let's, go to, let's go back to Hannah again. Um, Hannah, I would like to ask you, um, so obviously there are a multitude of sanctions imposed on Ukraine, uh, by Ukraine on Russia. But, but provide us with a glimpse of what you think are the most significant sanctions and, and more importantly, their impact. Thank you. Uh, thank you. As discussed, like against Russia, there have been massive measures introduced. But what I think can be interesting that Ukraine expanded significantly the program on personal sanctions and grounds for introducing personal sanctions as well as instrument of expropriation of, of property of um, person that have been sanctioned. So since February 2022, Ukraine additionally sanctioned more than 5,000 companies and more than 3,000 individuals. And uh, the law has been revised to uh, provide that eligibility criteria for sanctioning were facilitation of Russian, against, Russian aggression against Ukraine, which in particular uh, has such uh, grounds as payment of tax in Russia, providing financing, uh, and it means that companies uh, that, foreign companies, I mean international companies that still have business ties with Russia may qualify for being sanctioned in Ukraine if they continue doing business in Russia. And this is a major change that allows sanctioning a lot of companies and individuals. And on top of this, if they facilitate Russian aggression against Ukraine, and sanction their property in Ukraine can be expropriated without any compensation, which is a step that uh, Ukraine lobbied for international uh, sanctions, I mean, US or EU to, to allow expropriation and rechanneling frozen assets. So in Ukraine, this mechanism is already introduced. And um, within this, this personal sanction, there have been sanctioned huge amount of like, Russian companies and Russian businesses, and also beneficiaries of such businesses that created a pool of assets to be expropriated by, by Ukraine in Ukraine. And they actually have been um, cases where expropriation processes have been started. And it's like quite a few, we don't know exactly how many, because not all this information is public. Uh, and also until as it's actually expropriated, you don't have a certainty. But if you look at this, that within a year, 
the grounds for sanctioning for personal sanctions and also uh, the risk of expiration has been revised and there's been thousands of persons added to the list and thousands more can be added because Ukraine um, takes the position that they will consider sanctioning also foreign companies that do not leave the Russian market permanently and provide strategic financing or support, especially to the Russian defense, like military sector and other critical sectors for Russian economy. So I think th this is the key development that changes the view on, on, on the sanctions from a personal sanctions, in addition to complete like ban and on trade and, and economic payments and relations overall to, to Russia. Thank you, Anna. And I won't ask you to go into specifics there because I know once you drill down into those sanctions, it gets quite legalistic and, and technical. Um, so let's let's turn uh, back to uh, Ambassador Luby again. And, and I do apologize for cutting you off earlier. Your your sound was quite terrible, but um, I don't want to be the one responsible for for uh, causing a diplomatic incident. Um, but so feel free if, if there's anything that you wanted to mention. Uh, uh, from the earlier question that I posed to you. But um, I'd also like to ask you, um, how have sanctions impacted Estonia's economy and trade relations, particularly given uh, your geographical proximity to Russia? And more importantly, what has Estonia done in order to make its own companies and, and economy more resilient, not only to move away from Russia's import, imports and services, but also to prepare Estonia and Estonian companies for Russian retaliation. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, you can hear me now. Uh, maybe uh, to, to, uh, to follow up on the first question also, I think one very important question is that why, uh, uh, why uh, we need to implement sanctions at all? I think the, 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 it's, for me, it's a very easy answer. Uh, why? Because, you know, first of all, obviously, if uh, somebody, uh, let's say, uses uh, military force trying to conquer a, a neighboring country or uh, any, any country, so it cannot be business as usual. So we need to do something. So this is, of course, the moral aspect that, you know, we need to punish aggressor. Secondly, obviously, what I said before that, there is an economic impact as well. As well. Uh, Russia is already, the Russian economy is already suffering. Uh, the revenue stream is, is drying up. And also the thing is, we just need to have uh, more patience and we need to uh, keep the momentum. Why? Because, you know, if you think, you know, what, uh, what governments want, what usually governments want to do with the neighboring countries or uh, countries beyond or in the region. Uh, governments have motivations to join uh, single markets, custom unions, or just FTAs. Why? To improve its uh, trade links just to have more trade meaning, more business meaning, more revenue. So sanctions work exactly the reverse order, that you are cut out of all those, let's say, uh, mainstream or let's say fast track options that uh, should help your economy to prosper. So that's why sanctions are so instrumental. And the Russian economy was already beforehand quite primitive. So it was so dependent on, on uh, raw materials and now with sanctions, uh, the development is stuck for, for a long, long time. And we just need to keep in mind that the, uh, the impact, if not even immediate, it will have a very long term effects. Now what, Russia, what Estonia has done, it, Estonian uh, economy, I think, has uh, uh, withstood this, uh, this uh, let's say, uh, sanctions quite, uh, quite well. I think there are many aspects. First of all, our economy wasn't so dependent on, uh, on uh, Russian goods anyway. We were selling there quite a lot, and we still can sell products that are not sanctioned. And we imported, yes, we imported also uh, lots of oil and lots of gas. Now it's we got it off completely. Estonia was suffering so that uh, our inflation last year was one of the highest in Europe. Now it's stabilizing. It just, you know, the market needed some time to, to, uh, to uh, balance it out and just, you know, uh, adjust. Uh, I think in Estonia, what we did well and why probably we have succeeded rather well and been rather resilient, resilient in this respect, I think we were honest with our business and with our public. We said we cannot trade any longer with Russia. 
and everybody understood. There wasn't this kind of uh, false hopes that it's temporary and it will just you know go away in a, in a few months' time. We understand it's a long-term effect and it's rather permanent, so that we do our utmost to help our companies to direct everything you know to the other side. I give you just one example in 1993, 94, when Estonia just uh, uh, regained independence and, and occupation ended, then our government decided we wanted to join uh, European Union and NATO. And then Russian government decided to punish us and implemented double tariffs against all our goods, only Estonia. So before that happened, 90% of our trade was with the, uh, Russia. Two years later, it was 80% with the EU. Later, Russians even say they helped us to direct our economy fully from the east to the west. So uh, even now, this remaining part that is very minor, our trade maybe 8% only was with Russia, and mostly it's imports of raw materials. It's disappearing so that for our economy, I think, honestly, transparency has been the key. And now, of course, my job here in London as well is that if I can help those companies who did uh, business with Russia before, maybe they can do business now with the UK. Thank you, Vilyar. Uh, I think that's great insight also. And, and I, I must really commend Estonia in uh, uh, taking early action and posing uh, sanctions against Russia, but also it's, it's great support, uh, military support, uh, the, the highest last year per, per capita in terms of GDP um, for Ukraine, of course. And, uh, and I think uh, Estonia, of course, has a very strong sense of of the, the 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 threat that the region is facing as a result of what is happening but um yeah your energy sector has also been extremely impressive in implementing measures to make the estonian economy more res resilient for what's to come because as you laid out earlier um, you have to take a long-term view when it comes to sanctions um let's turn again uh to to uh timothy again um now, Timothy, uh, in response to sanctions, the Kremlin is taking a variety of countermeasures against Western companies based in Russia. And, and last week, I know that uh, Putin signed a decree to take temporary control of Russian assets of Fen Finnish energy company Fortum and Germany's uh, Uniper, which of course triggered fears, fresh fears of nationalization of Western companies. The Kremlin also hit back with its own package of sanctions and capital controls, which in essence restrict the ability of Western companies to leave the Russian market and for investors to transfer profits or dividends back home. Now, how are those measures impacting on Russia? Is the Kremlin simply shooting itself in the foot? What is your perspective? You're correct. Um, that Russia has recently taken a control of Fortum and Uniper um, and that they violated almost all um, control rights over the investment of foreign investors. So the foreigners almost don't have access to the dividends and they need Putin or special commission approval to exit. It is true that Russia in that sense shooting maybe itself in the foot, but really they have shot themselves with the invasion. This is a minor thing. And in practice, I think, and even I on record have been making this point to foreign companies operating in Russia is that you guys have been expropriated already. Your companies have been de facto nationalized. You don't have the right for free exit. And if you try to do something, you will be sanctioned or uh, you will be nationalized. Um, the lack of control by the companies goes further. For example, if you stop operating your company, the local FSB can actually take control of those specific uh, facilities that have stopped operating. It will force people to continue to operate in the interest of national security. There have been cases reported like that privately to me in Davos, as early as in Davos, uh, by some of the Western European, uh, German, Swiss, and other companies. So people should simply stop being in denial. Your assets have been nationalized de facto. 
And the best you can do is to document that and sue Russia in other jurisdictions where Russia has assets and pressure your government to pass legislations to be able to confiscate Russian assets because you don't own your companies anymore, but on paper. Thank you, Timothy, for that view. And, and I should tell our audience also uh, that, that Timothy is part of the International Working Group on, on Russian sanctions. So this is uh, something that, that he studies at a, at a very deep le level on, on, on what, can be, what is happening, but also what can be done. And we'll come, we'll, we'll circle back on some of those questions to him shortly. Um, let's go back to Hannah first again. Uh, Hannah, uh, what have been the main challenges in implementing and enforcing Ukraine sanctions against Russia? Thank you. Uh, thank you. So it, it a lot depends on the sanctions. Uh, if we talk about sexual sanctions, they actually have been implemented by banks and they, they do work. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of attempts to circumvent sanctions by third countries that uh, require investigating where actually either the goods come from or where they go. There have been many cases when uh, via third countries that continued trade of certain Ukrainian products destined to Russia, which was not obvious, and same certain Russian goods have been uh, ending in Ukraine via third countries. And there are lots of investigations by security service and the prosecution office of such violations, which uh, will be like subject to criminal liability under Ukrainian law. But we need to understand that there's only been a year and there are like a massive um, uh, violations that authorities investigate in Ukraine. So I think the lack of capacity is the key challenge. Uh, and we know that. Um, Within the first year of war, like, like oh, since Feb 24th, February 2022, there have been more than 2,300 criminal proceedings opened, which are currently pending. And I would assume that more of them op are opened every day, but the capacity to investigate and come to, to a conclusion is, of course, limited both by the courts and, and the investigative authorities. So this is one of the challenges, just the scope and, and the massive of, of, of violations that have to be investigated. The other is, of course, there's a room for improvement of Ukrainian legislation, and there have been many um, uh, proposals considered. Uh, also to prevent the convention of sanctions or to strengthen the legislation and liability for the convention of sanctions. In particular, we have a new draft criminal law uh, criminalizing the convention, although it's already criminalized by different crimes. So, so for Ukrainian sanctions, I, I think there's a real lack of time and capacity, but taking the periods of limitation are huge, like, I mean, 40 years, 20 years, there still can be enforcement late in time. And, and this is what I want to draw attention, that the fact that there has been no enforcement like within a year, either in Ukraine, EU or US even, it doesn't mean that it will not come in two years, five years or 10 years, because the periods of limitations for such type of violations are very long. And this is a criminal liability cases. So what I think that the enforcement will be strengthened within time, uh, while each country and Ukraine in particular have more capacity and to, to, to deal with such complex cases. And usually these this are complex cases. And if we look at Ukraine, um, uh, we have lots of war crimes investigated. We have lots of expro expropriation cases pending and including this um, circumvention of sanctions investigation. So there's a lot on the plate for the Ukrainian authorities. But but I'm pretty sure that that enforcement will be followed because there is an intent of all authorities to uh, prevent the convention and to enforce sanctions on all levels. Yeah, I think I think it would it's even hard to imagine from the outside uh, uh, how hard it is to focus on enforcement of such such a um, ever expanding uh, amount of sanctions and laws. Um, especially while Ukraine is 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 right in the middle of of defending its own uh, territorial integrity. Um, so, 
Um, but course, I want, want to say that Ukraine yeah. was very efficient, for example, in expropriation. Yeah. Uh, uh, so irrespective of the war and what we discussed, there are lots of going on. There are more than 100 assets already in the expropriation stage, which is a matter of enforcement. And there have been quite a few already uh, criminal law rulings on, on different sanctions and convention uh, cases. And I, I think Ukraine is is um, dedicated to, to to this cause. So it's not like it's delayed. It's just like the, the number of cases is thousands, and you have time. You need time to digest and and to consider them both in the investigative stage and in the court stage. So it's. But within a year, I think there is a progress. There could be more progress on legislative level to make it smoother and more efficient. But there is progress on the enforcement stage. And, and I think it will be more and more. And there was a lot of discussion from private companies saying, we have enforcement. And when we look, I, I think there was a priority for enforcement against Russian companies and Russian oligarchs are the first priority. And once I think th this will be addressed uh, in the full, they will go to the next and next uh, steps in enforcement. Anna, thank you for that clarity. I, I think the, the enforcement also speaks to that heightened sense of security that, that Ukraine is, is feeling and, and urgency in addressing some of these issues and, and making that space uh, smaller for Russia and harder to achieve some of its goals. Um, let's let's move again to to uh, Villar, to you. Uh, what are the main challenges for Estonia in terms of um, enforcing sanctions against Russia while we're talking about this issue of enforcement? Thank you. I think you know what Hanna said is so important uh, that yes, uh, European Union is right now uh, preparing its eleventh uh, package of sanctions, and it is mostly uh, related to enforcement. So uh, filling all the loopholes and trying to uh, create uh, ways to, to, uh, to uh, let's say, to uh, block this uh, cir circumvention of, uh, of sanctions that has been so critical right now. Uh, I think this kind of secondary sanctions uh, need to be in place. We are, pl we are planning that also, that other countries that maybe use uh, uh, ways to, let's say, uh, bypass sanctions, are can, can be warned, let's say that legislation is in place and just, you know, the name of the country and the segment is uh, not specified. First, you know, this kind of uh, unfilled draft might be sent to the country and if this is not corrected, then the secondary sanctions against the third country will be followed. I think this one thing we need to do. In Estonia, it's the same. The circumvention is uh, is a very important, very crucial. Right now, if they take Estonian customs alone, it's uh, two thirds. It's only linked to controlling the sanctions, and because of the uh, restrictions uh, on bank transactions and also ban of exports of euros, uh, the cash related uh, violations have increased in Estonia alone two thousand seven hundred percent. So it's a huge, huge increase. Of course, you know, cryptocurrencies has been a big uh, issue as well, increasingly, so that uh, we jointly, definitely, I think, important thing is that what Estonia does doesn't, is not so relevant. What we uh, jointly do is much more relevant because sanctions only work if we collectively make sure that these are properly implemented. So therefore, uh, Estonia is working very closely uh, with the EU, uh, uh, First of all, but also other partners. So the G7 also brings in other partners uh, I mean, globally uh, that we we can make sure that, that that sanctions are properly implemented. And maybe last thing I want to say is that uh, uh, let's say enforcement of sanctions is important. But secondly, also that we need to use momentum and uh, keep uh, let's say adding up the pressure on Russia. That's why Estonia definitely has been one of the strongest advocates that we should bring down the gap of, uh, let's say, oil, oil price, that we should keep a pressure on that as well. So we see that the oil gap is working so that India and China, they are buying Russian oil, but with, a, let's say, a discounted price. So it's already hurting Russians. So we have to uh, put the next pressure so that the, 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 uh, 
price cap should come even lower. And, and then, of course, you know, we have to make sure that these, as I said, you know, uh, circumvention wouldn't happen because one, 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 as you know, one of the problems also is the blending. So that uh, now companies and businesses find ways how to circumvent so that blending oil from, uh, from uh, different countries countries so that you cannot track it so easily what is the country of origin so these kind of loopholes how to how uh, sort it out i think this is our next priority thank you and i i should note that estonia together with the other two baltic countries and and poland have played a a, a very impressive role within the eu for pushing for the expansion of, of sanctions um so i'd be very interested to see what you're what you're going to do in this uh, 11th round of, of the sanctions regime um timothy i know uh, you're welcome to contact uh, to comment on on uh, what what the ambassador has also said because i know you may have some thoughts on on secondary sanctions and we'll we'll talk more about circumvention of of sanctions um, later on but feel free to comment um i also want to ask you a question from one of our audience members uh, john newman who's asking, is it possible to quantify the impact of sanctions on the military conflict? Um, in other words, are sanctions blunting Russian aggression? It also relates to what I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, how, how these sanctions are impacting on Russia's ability to produce military hardware and equipment. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. There are reports which argue that uh, Russia has lost its capacity to produce most tanks. And there's also, according to the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, there is a report on this current stock of uh, high precision missile arsenal. For example, uh, if you look at the caliber missiles, which are the most frequent we'll see in the, in the news, which are difficult to intercept, we have about 13% left according to this report. Uh, on the other hand, if you will look at um, S-300s, which were repurposed, there are still about 7,000 left. So they used 1,000, so 87%. 37% of missiles left for the uh, sea-launched missiles. And we talk about air, air-launched uh, missiles such as uh, KH-101, KH-555, Cage 22, Cage 35, Cage and Kinjal. Then we have, well, in Kinjal, we still have 73% of them left, but in others, we have 50, 50, 32, or 41, uh, respectively. So, in that sense, of course, sanctions are working, but it is not at zero in their countries and companies which allow or facilitate circumvention of the sanctions. And uh, even post uh, invasion or post escalation of the February uh, 22 um, time stamped um, electronics or high precision equipment from the West finds its way to Russia. That has been documented. Some of these reports are public. Some of these reports are classified, but there is direct evidence documented uh, by the Ukrainian side and shown to the partners that circumvention of uh, sanctions is happening. So the countries uh, that uh, people are talking about, of course, uh, you know, of China, North Korea, and Iran, of course, I mean, this is in the news. Uh, some, uh, you know, some blame Turkey, but other two countries such as Armenia and Georgia are also come, uh, countries in which many, many people, Russian citizens, open companies, and these companies facilitate the gray market or kind of create confusion and non-transparency. Uh, and some of these efforts are systemic. So it's a race, it's a sanctions arms race, and it's a dynamic, uh, dynamic environment in which uh, imposing new sanctions will have to continue as long as Russia tries to circumvent. The moment someone stops, either our side or Russia, the other side will lose. And I'm pretty sure that we will have to continue to impose new and new sanctions. But for that, we need very careful, analytical work monitoring the ways the sanctions are bypassed. So I, I think one of the main takeaways, you know, in, in, in kind of like studying this issue quite closely on, on sanctions against Russia 
you know, we, we in the Western world continue to do what we're doing and expanding our sanctions, um, as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing uh, more modern weapons to, to Ukraine uh, in order for Ukraine to be able to defend itself. Um, you know, uh, Ukraine could win this war. Um, is, is that more or less your main conclusion there, Timothy? Um, it's a complementary tool. Uh, Russia will be forced to stop the war. So the resolution here is to stop the war by force. Unfortunately, Russia understands force. It doesn't understand the diplomacy or even financial instruments or sanctions. You know, they are willing to send people to die with shovels instead of weapons. And they have a lot of people and they have no regard for human life. They have demonstrated it time and again. They have no regard for human life of non-Russians, but also of Russians, including so-called, um, which I don't subscribe to, uh, pro-Russian ethnic Russians in Ukraine. They destroyed, you know, they killed tens of thousands of people in Mariupol and Eastern Ukraine recently during this uh, offensive. Uh, and so that shows that they will stop nowhere. Most of politicians and diplomats, you know, are used to trying to find ways to negotiate, to find a compromise. So this is incompatible thinking. And what Russia has been able to do is to hijack the security, the you know, international security framework by basically um, engaging in propaganda in the same uh, way, hybrid violations of the lines. They keep gradually pushing red lines, uh, pretending they have not been pushed. So, so it is true that sanctions are important, but the war will be stopped by force. Thank you, Timothy. Um, let's go back to, to Hannah. Uh, Hannah, talk to us about lobbying. How does Ukraine influence other countries to expand their sanction regimes? And what are the priority sanctions that Ukraine is pushing for at present? I think Ukrainian government was very active in, in framing the sanctions policy uh, in different countries. So they have the view and ideas, and they are actively engaged and communicate different options, including now on circumvention of sanctions with their international partners. So a lot of sanctions that have been approved either in the EU or US actually have been uh, proposed by the Ukrainian government like in, in, in the material way. So I, I think there is um, a lot of lobbying and influence Ukraine is doing. And sometimes Ukraine tries also to lead by example, for example, sanctioning uh, like sectoral sanction against Russian financial sector. They didn't have a practical meaning because all these transactions have already been banned in Ukraine long ago, but they did it themselves just to, to lead by example as well, because they asked to do this, the international partners, and for example, sanctions in nuclear area is, is very much against Rosatom and all uh, their operations worldwide have been lobbied by Ukraine and influenced by Ukraine. So I think there's a lot and done. And uh, maybe Timothy can extend on this. There's like a working group that uh, provide like uh, develops working papers on regular basis with a view what the next round of sanctions should look like or um, areas on the convention of sanction that can be improved. And these papers are communicated internationally to international partners, both by, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or by the administration of presidents or on, on multiple layers. There is Ukrainian uh, view on the sanctions is, is communicated and, and, and asked for both publicly and uh, I'm sure in private talks. And at the moment, Ukraine itself is expanding their sanctions and they propose sectoral sanctions against Iran as discussed Iran was facilitating Russian aggression by providing dual use goods and military use goods so there's a huge package of um, sectoral sanctions against dual use prohibiting actually uh, the trade of dual use goods with Iran and uh, Ukraine also uh, develop sanctions against other countries, not only to Russia, but other countries that uh, directly or uh, indirectly facilitate the circumvention of sanctions. Uh, so so I, I think that 
this effort will continue as long as the war goes on and um, at least um, in some statements uh, of the working group and Ukrainian authorities said that more than half of the proposals uh, have been implemented. So, so there's a quite high success rate of these uh, lobbying activities. Thank you for that insight, Hannah. Um, let's let's go back to Bulyar again. Um, earlier, I mentioned that that of course Estonia, together with the other Baltic states, have have quite a, a reputation as 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 being tough on on sanctions against Russia compared to other EU member states. And um, what is Estonia's position on on potential additional EU sanctions against Russia for this next round that that you mentioned? And 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 what measures would Tallinn like to see implemented? Thank you. Um, first of all, I have to say that, you know, I fully agree with what the professor said, that this war is not the one with sanctions. This war will be won by Ukraine by Fox. And that's why I think what uh, NATO, EU and the partners are doing, that uh, helping the Ukraine to arm itself as much as possible so that, that uh, they can uh, effectively defend their territory and liberate uh, it from the Russian aggressor. I think this is the, uh, the primary uh, priority right now. But uh, sanctions are very important, what I said before, in the long term. Because, you know, aggressor needs to understand that uh, every aggression has a cost. And especially right now, if you think, you know, uh, uh, globally speaking, if a similar kind of uh, aggression uh, happens elsewhere, let's say it happens over Taiwan, then all the assessments show that the impact of global economy will be much higher than the current war in Ukraine. Therefore, it's even more important to show that aggression cannot pay off. There is a penalty, there is a punishment, both political, but also economic one, and we have to push forward even more. Uh, otherwise, if we don't do it, lessons will be learned and the price tag later will be even higher economically speaking. Uh, what we can do more, what they said, you know, circumvention and, you know, to do anything we can in order to, uh, to avoid that, that is the primary thing. But probably we need to even try oil and gas, I think is the most important thing because it's just the biggest, biggest uh, piece of the, uh, the whole pie that we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid and we have to uh, uh, pressure on that. But, uh, what I said about the price gap, that we should keep it low, uh, bring it lower. But what Hanna said also about the individuals, this is also important. Because the, uh, the uh, common knowledge, at least in our part of the world, is if Russia gets angry, it means it's, it's working. And one of the, uh, let's say, restrictions Estonia and, uh, and Poland and the Eastern Bank uh, implemented last year was that we stopped issuing uh, Schengen visas. And also, we, we uh, let's say, uh, we stopped uh, those Russians coming out across the outer border and flying from Tallinn to London. And it really hurt because, you know, Moscow reacted. On many other things, they did not. But on that front, they did react. So it means it was hurting them. Uh, Russia plays a long game. They really hope that they can just sit it out much easier than we can. So therefore, they try to uh, find ways to... to uh, uh, sit quietly and hope that you know the storm goes away. Uh, we see other options, you know, what we can do and what we are thinking and considering. One is real estate. We see that, for example, in Estonia, that more and more Russians want to uh, keep their assets safe. They want to buy real estate, and you know later they can cash it and you know start the normal life again. So that one option is that we uh, prohibit also. Uh, Russians to buy real estate, not only in e Estonia, but the whole EU. Or we see that also more and more Russians are either directly or through, uh, let's say, those uh, shadow persons, straw men, uh, in the manage uh, management boards of different companies. This is also one way that, you know, we don't allow uh, Russians to be in the management of any company that is acting in the, in the, in the EU. Sanctions, you know, maybe the last point I want to say is that I am a strong believer that we need to go on. I think I'm economist by training. They will have a long-term effect. Uh, the short-term effect, or maybe even long-term effect uh, with Russia, is that, unfortunately, 
If you take the Russian history over the past hundred years, it seems that unfortunately, even the Russians themselves, they don't care too much about the livelihoods. I think the, uh, Russia is the only, if not the only uh, example in the, in the history of the, uh, let's say, uh, former colonial power that tries to increase or make its colony bigger, or let's say its empire bigger uh, at the expense of its own people. I understand the instinct that you want to make your motherland more rich, but if you take Russia, Russia is happy to give up its livelihood just to be an empire. And this is this biology is so twisted that how to overcome this? And unfortunately, uh, the uh, the Russian government doesn't care about its own citizens. So therefore, also, it's, of course, it's very important what I said about this real estate and you know being in a management board. We have to see what are the Russians who live in Moscow and Saint Petersburg what they worry about the most. Because anybody else, you know, if you don't have anything to lose already right now, so you care less and then the influence or the impact is uh, more limited. Thank you, Viljard. And I, I wanna kind of bounce off on something that you mentioned uh, ab about the uh, the visa uh, uh, ban ag uh, against uh, Russians traveling also to, to the Baltics. Um, I know, Timothy, in your, in your brand new report that was published by the International Working Group on Russian Sanctions, you also made reference to uh, that, that uh, visa ban, but you recommended um, that there be some form of reconstruction, uh, Ukraine reconstruction tax or something uh, uh, for Russians traveling uh, to other places that, that could be put in place. But um, I'd love you. I'd love it if you would highlight a few of the most important recommendations you made in, in, in that report. If you could shed some light on that for us, Timothy, please. Of course, absolutely. One I already talked about uh, was, um, uh, was uh, ban on, uh, well, designation of state sponsor of terrorism. Um, but the most important is uh, strengthening sanctions on oil and energy. The current oil price cap is not binding and we should bring it down to 30, if not possible to 45, if we are serious about sanctioning Russia. Why it is important? Well, it's because this is unsanctioned uh, um, revenues which are coming into Russia and liquidity is going to be used to finance the war you know if russia has 10 billion dollars free they can put hundreds of thousand soldiers uh, on the field so it's a very direct uh, relationship between liquidity of new funds coming in and um, and uh, the uh, amount uh, of support they can give to the military forces and to recruitment of new people so it's lose lose situation people will die on both sides because russia uh, is uh, is given liquidity now uh, of course we shouldn't go to zero why because russia should be able to pay for its costs then energy embargo we should end the direct uh, supply of Russian gas to the European Union, build a reserve buffer of gas in Ukraine, and embargo Russian energy in East Asia. Um, impose full sanctions on all Russian oil and gas companies and sanction Gazprom Bank. And we should impose full taxation on Western oil and gas companies remaining in Russia because people have to feel the cost of doing this. In metals, metals are being used to actually produce tanks. So we can impose an embargo. We recommend imposing an embargo on all iron and steel products and extend sanctions to metal companies that supply raw materials to Russian military in particular. Some of the funding, you would be surprised, is coming actually from diamonds. So we should impose sanctions on uh, diamond companies, um, Russian-related diamond companies in Russia and elsewhere in the world, including in Africa, uh, related to Wagner, uh, that uh, are financing the military operation. Uh, most importantly, we have to strengthen military sanctions, improve cooperation on sanctions on military and dual-use goods, because this Miscoordination helps to bypass the sanctions and enhance expert controls and enforcement capability. We should impose secondary sanctions on companies which help in third countries to circumvent dual um, and military and dual use goods. And um, 
we should also extend the dual use goods to include any civil goods which are used as a part of military operations in particular. This is just one of the several sanctions we have. Um, you know, I, the list goes on. It's actually, I, uh, I kind of highlighted about 20% of the executive summary <laughs> to, to be, <laughs> to be uh, short on this. But most importantly, sanctions on uh, oil, on the price cap, uh, and uh, making sure that the, you know we have to go after their liquidity. We have to go after the new funds which are coming to Russia, uh, and that means sanctioning banks. Thank you, Timothy. And I'm I'm, I'm going to drop a link also to your uh, new report uh, for our audience members who are interested uh, in that particular report. Um, let's circle back again uh, to Hannah. Hannah, very briefly. Um, could you please tell us, uh, because, because obviously this war has, has massive impacts on, 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 on Ukraine's economy, where do you see opportunities to invest in Ukraine at present? And what's your main uh, advice to any investors in, in the international community? So, so I'm not a financial advisor, investment advisor, I'm a lawyer, first of all, but we do see need and we see interest in, in investment project on diversifying energy uh, uh, infrastructure. And there's both like need in, for, for Ukraine taking the, the extensive uh, attacks that have happened in this winter. And also I see interest from private investors. There have been um, a lot of discussion and some projects started in changing the logistics, like warehousing, river ports, um, taking into account that, that the war may continue for another year, let's put it this way, and and trade, especially grain trade, sh should continue and, and should be simplified because um, uh, this year uh, trade was significantly impaired. Uh, and partially because Ukrainian logistic was very much port um, related, like CC port related. And now there is um, a lot of discussion around development of river ports. Uh, so uh, these are immediate uh, projects that, that are discussed. But uh, of course, investment is, is there are lots of commercial opportunities always. And what investors should, should look at, um, of course, war is a factor should be considered and not so much as a high risk, but how you mitigate this risk from a legal term. So there should be thinking of more flexibility uh, and how you incorporate this flexibility into your projects. So uh, it's it's a it's a like one hour discussion if we discuss how, how, how to do investment during, during war, what, what to look at. But I think there's still an opportunity, there's still interest. And even there is a war, there are lots of uh, factors that can be considered and can be taken into account to make the project still a huge success. Thank you, Hannah, for those encouraging words. And I do hope we discuss that more and more as we head to the conference in London also, which I believe is in June, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on, on how uh, uh, we can better support Ukraine in, in that regard also. Um, Ambassador um, Luby, any, any final words from you before I um, turn to Timothy to close us off? Thank you. I, I follow up where Hannah just uh, uh, finished. Uh, what can be done, you know? I don't want to say any, any, anything else, maybe on the sanctions, but, you know, uh, of course, you know, the primary concern is to, uh, to help uh, Ukraine to win the war, and also while doing that, how to sustain the economy uh, up and running. And then only comes, you know, the recover, uh, let's say the reconstruction phase. Right now, it's just, you know, that maintaining the economy. Uh, and of course, there is no a clear answer. Uh, what are the investment opportunities? But in a way, maybe I still try to give uh, some, some ideas. Uh, I, I would like to draw a parallel with uh, another tragedy that uh, we all faced just a few years ago, COVID. And the thing is that it, COVID also, it was a huge strategy for the globe, but also it created the economic opportunities. That when I was in charge of all the economy, economic rescue package for Estonia, I, 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 I told the government early on, don't tell anyone that you want to uh, get back where we were before COVID. 
use the opportunity and build something that you really need before. Use the use the opportunity. And I think what the Ukraine is already doing right now, and we should do whatever we can to support it, also make investments, is that you to, uh, to uh, fast forward or let's say give an extra kick to the new economy for Ukraine. So I give it three three uh, examples. One is, of course, you know, how to keep the government running. I think what uh, Ukraine did last year, uh, introducing TIA, uh, mobile government, it was really, really helpful. It was also in a way that uh, the, the circumstances uh, gave it the extra push so that the critical mass was there and you know, people started to use it uh, extensively, immediately. It really has helped the citizen to be in contact with the government and also make, therefore, bureaucracy more effective. Second thing, it's all about supply chains. So anything concerning logistics is very, very important, especially in a country at war, so that all those new technology opportunities that you make can make logistics more efficient is fantastic. And third one is linked to that, energy. Given that tax, you know, Russia is targeting the uh, Ukrainian energy systems so that those smaller but efficient versions, let's say, is it the wind farms, solar or other options that uh, create more decentralized energy grid and energy capacity, uh, production capacity, it would really help a country like Ukraine. And you, these are the areas where you can have early investments. Thank you, Marcel. Those are great points, also especially on energy. And, and thank you also earlier for bringing up the oil cap, which uh, Timothy also alluded to, uh, which is so important, uh, especially given that you have uh, a, an aggressor country which has built its entire strategy around uh, the energy sector by and large. Um, Timothy, do, do you have time for just one more question uh, to close us off? Yes? Okay, excellent. Uh, Timothy, I, I know that uh, one of our participants, Jon Grant, asked something uh, related to which third countries other than Turkey are seeing large increases in key imports. Um, I think you've, you've, you've sort of uh, already uh, talked about that issue a little bit, but uh, maybe if I could add to that, um, you know, you, you mentioned that, that we have Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. We're also part of some of the regular offenders, you know, in terms of sanctions. And and I should add, it's not always intentional. Sometimes it has to do with uh, uh, just being educated about some of these measures. And and, and you know, uh, of course, legislation these sanctions um, change on a regular basis. So um, companies are not always updated on these issues. Uh, that said. Um, um, some of these countries are, of course, NATO uh allies and partners so what should the us eu and uk be doing to prevent circumvention of sanctions among some of our partners and allies which presumably is very different from how we would respond to say north korea or iran what what are your thoughts on that i agree uh absolutely i also want to add to this list um so they are not necessarily NATO countries, but uh, among the countries which I have not mentioned, there are consciously or not consciously, as you said, some people might not know that they are helping, or some people are helping both sides, knownly or not knownly, or within the country there could be polarization, that some people are pro-Ukrainians and some people are pro-Russians, that happens too. But uh, Kazakhstan, India, United Arab Emirates, they have been... Uh, uh, conducive in bypassing sanctions uh, directly or indirectly and again consciously or uh, subconsciously. Uh, secondary sanctions and education um, and coordination of the standards, especially when it comes to anything related to dual use or military equipment. The standards are different all over place, all over the world. So, you know, we have Rammstein body for synchronization and alignment of the military support. We now have economic crunch time, you know, we, we can discuss how well it's functioning, but hopefully we should have something like that, a coordinating body. In, in some sense, that body exists. The coordinators of sanctions don't want to be publicly known. So there are people uh, in governments assigned to track sanctions and the implementation, but I think much more coordination can be done 
And these people should be given much more capacity because this fork is, is actually very technical. It's a contact sport in so many ways. It's, it's one, of course, by the, some kind of fundamentals. But in the end of the day, when you're in a ring, it's your training, your practice, your technique, which also matters. And it is as much as 50% or more of the uh, victory. So we need to give these people more very highly qualified personnel, resources, and the uh, authority to enforce the sanctions. And that's a little bit under the hood, but that's an important part of it. You can have a great car, but if the engine is not as powerful as it needs to be, it's not going to perform well. And right now, we need the car with the most powerful engine possible. Thank you, Timothy. I, I think that's a, that's a great analogy also. Um, I, I'd like to, on that note, thank all three of our panelists um, for your great input and insight into this discussion. Uh, Hannah Stepa, uh, Ambassador Bilyar Lubi, and of course, uh, the one and only Professor Timothy Malovanov. Um, thank you so much for your time, and, and we really appreciate um, that, that you joined us again. Uh, thank you also to our audience members for your support, for tuning in, and join us uh, for our next Russia-Ukraine dialogue I will focus on how this will end. Thank you again to everyone and goodbye. Thank you.